Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Divorcing Religion podcast. I'm your host, Janice Selby, and I'm just thrilled to have my friend, Dr. Daryl Ray, joining us as today's guest. And uh, Dr. Ray is a psychologist and author and the beloved founder of Recovering from Religion. So welcome, Dr. Daryl, and a big happy birthday to you. Well, thank you. Yeah, I'm having a good uh, birthday. Had a good birthday weekend. Nice. So that's all the count. I got lots of wine. People brought oh. lots of wine for my birthday party this weekend. So I'm I'm a very happy camper for about another week or two. That sounds wonderful. <laughs> I that have sounds about a wonderful. bottle of wine per day for the next two weeks. <laughs> oh my! I think I should come for a visit. Is what I think. <laughs> you would be totally 172 percent welcome. So there you go. <laughs> and I I can't help but notice the wonderful display that you have up behind you. I recognize those books and a very interesting uh, pink object that you have there as well recognize a teeny tiny dildo oh, is that what you're saying that's <laughs> <laughs> it looks it looks familiar what can i say <laughs> um and so i'm just glad that you're able to join us today even in the middle of your birthday um festivities and i think people would be interested to hear about your own personal background with religion did you grow up in a religious home what flavor was it and and why did you leave well, I was, uh, you want the short story or the long story? <laughs> we can, we can go with whatever you like. I know people okay. will be interested. Well, I was born into a fairly religious home. I would say they were marginally fundamentalist. My mm -hmm. grandparents were very fundamentalist, but my parents were a little bit looser. Although we were in church, uh, went mostly whenever the doors were open, the mm -hmm. minimum three times a week, wow. twice on Sunday, you know, Sunday morning and the Sunday evening service. Of course, we had youth group Sunday evening too. you know, all these um, opportunities to get brainwashed. Um, mm -hmm. Bible study Wednesday night, we had choir practice Wednesday night. I was a, I was in choir. Uh, I loved singing. Still do. Nice. One thing I do miss about religion is the singing. And Same here. I was a tenor soloist for several different churches. Even got paid occasionally for singing. Wow. So I was I was pretty good. I still have a pretty good voice for my age, I guess. <laughs> we need to form a band. <laughs> we got to come up with a really good name too. <laughs> yep. Uh, well, that that shouldn't be hard to come up with a really good name, and we've got a wide range of options there, don't we? <laughs> we do. So anyway, um, you know, I got. I was just looking at something the other day. I, I have a de baptism certificate in my living room. Love it. Uh, and I was thinking, okay, when did that mean? When was I baptized? And it turns out, my de baptism happened almost the same time uh, in April that I got baptized back in 1959. Mm -hmm. So I got baptized in April 15, April 9th, 1959. And I got debaptized um, oh, somewhere in 2014, I think it was. <laughs> wow. wow. At, the American, that... at the American Atheist Convention. Oh, perfect. <laughs> perfect. That sounds about right. So what, Edward... what led you away from religion? Well, it started when I was uh, about 12 years old and I was out. We went and always visited my, uh, we, we spent Thanksgiving going to um, Gallup, New Mexico, actually 60 miles outside of Gallup in the middle of the Navajo Indian Reservation, where my aunt and uncle were federal employees for the Bureau of Indian Affairs teaching school there. But they were under the radar missionaries there. They really were oh. federal employees to convert Indians. That was their oh, whole gosh. mission. You know, it was, it was, I mean, in retrospect it was horrible, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm, I, I love going to their house because they've got these enormous mesas right behind their house and lots of Indian artifacts around Hogan's. It, it was, you know, it was true wild West Navajo, a reservation wow. for a 12 year old, you know, mm -hmm. I go to the top and at the time I had studied, I love biology. I'd studied a little bit about evolution, much to my grandparents chagrin. My parents didn't seem to care. And I'm on the top of this, this Mesa and I'm picking up shark's teeth, 500 shark's teeth, shark's teeth on the top of a Mesa, 500 feet above where my aunt and uncle's house is. Uh, I had brought a vial because I like to collect things. I'd bought a vial, I filled a vial, a little, a pretty good sized medicine vial full of shark's teeth. It was just 
just, you know, a 12 year old kid's dream. Of course, I come back down. I show my mom and my aunt these shark's teeth. And I say, you know, mom, aunt Margie, how did those shark's teeth get way up there on the top of the mesa? And, and my aunt says, well, God put them there in the flood. And in back of my mind, I said, well, you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Even at that age, I knew that was not right. So when I get this, don't ask to don't ask questions from my aunt, from my grandparents, uh, that that is the exact opposite of what my personality wants to do. You know, it's like a red flag in front of a bull. I'm going to go yeah. after So that really turned me on to evolution and evolutionary biology. And <laughs> I I went into uh, college um, uh, and I, I took my, my major turned out to be um, sociology and anthropology. Mm. Now, anthropology is a bad thing to be studying if you uh, want to stay religious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I got more and more liberal and farther and farther away from what my grandparents approved of. Mm-hmm. My parents, again, they, they, I think they knew me. They understood you ain't going to contain Daryl. I'm the oldest <laughs> in the family. Uh, all four boys are really smart. Ultimately, uh, four, no girls, just four boys. Uh, ultimately, not one of us would darken the door of a church when we got mm-hmm. the medals. Mm-hmm. So they did something right or wrong. I'm not sure which <laughs> look at it. But I still wanted to help people. Here I am in college. I want to help people. I got this. I, I'm, I'm not sold on the Bible. I don't think it's, you know, it's metaphorical at best. Mm -hmm. And I am teaching. uh, My parents started this church called Antioch Christian church. Uh, They actually started two churches. They were church planters. They started Riverlawn Christian church as well. In fact, just last week, there was an article, you know, Kansas had the vote no um, uh, against the amendment Mm -hmm. that we, we just 17 points blew away the, the, uh, anti-abortion group. And so the journalist, this journalist went down to Wichita and around around the state to interview people. And they they started off at the church my parents started. We were oh, you're kidding. Riverlawn Christian Church. So you you start reading this article. First thing, first paragraph, Riverlawn Christian Church. I'm thinking, mm. whoa, <laughs> that's the church my parents founded. Yeah. And not long after my and the minister had um, three different affairs when he shouldn't have. Of oh, course. dear. And my parents finally got sick of it and left the church. Uh, my in-laws came in not later. I did, they weren't my in-laws yet. And they they be, my in-law, father-in-law became the chairman of the board of this church. And ultimately, they fired the minister for the fourth affair that he had. Oh, Take my four, gosh. Four times and you're out. But anyway, <laughs> so that's River Lawn Christian Church. And this was happening... I should just say that ministers are having affairs all over the city of of my church. We belong to the uh, Christian independent Christian church, which is a Camelite movement that kind of started in the 1820s. It's semi-conservative, semi-fundamentalist. You know, if you're not dunked underwater, you're probably going to hell. I got dunked. So I'm, I'm, I'm definitely (laughs) safe. That's a relief. (laughs) But the the hilarious thing is, in my sophomore year, I am teaching. Uh, I, I get a job to for five dollars a week in in nineteen seventy one to do the youth group for Antioch Christian Church, and I am just um, I love teaching. I'm I'm a I'm a pretty good teacher, and I love teaching. But I would be teaching, uh, you know, how the Bible's compatible with evolution in my Sunday school class. And I'm like, oh boy, <laughs> <laughs> I am the I'm the son of the founder of this church, so they can't give me too much shit, you know. So what they do is they give me a, a an escort, a, an adult, I guess you could say, to always attend my classes. Yeah, <laughs> and it turns out that Ada was her name, and she and I just got along great, and I think secretly she was very happy to see me teaching this stuff. I don't know for sure, but she never, she never gave me any trouble. And I'm sitting here doing comparative analysis of Australopithecus and Ramopithecus (laughs) in in Sunday school. (laughs) I love it. And getting, getting away with it. My downfall though. And I ultimately got fired from that job because uh, I met a friend who was a black minister at a, at a black Christian church in, in Wichita, where 
where Antioch Christian Church was. And I'm thinking, well, they're Christian churches like we are. I mean, they're same, literally the same movement. It's just there was a black side of the, I didn't know there was a black church until I met him. Mm-hmm. And so that tells you something, yeah. which is a very segregated town. Mm. And so I invite him to meet me um, at our youth group building. And uh, he shows up in his school bus with all his kids. Up to that point, I, every Sunday night, I would beg and beg and beg parents to come and help me control these uh, wildly hormone or hormonal teenagers. I'd get, I went from having three or four kids to having 30 kids showing up every Sunday night. Wow. I was good at this stuff. Yeah. I could really get kids excited about shit. And, but I could never get a parent to help me. So I would catch kids, you know, screwing in the back behind the, <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> it, was, it was hard. I mean, how do you corral a hormonal teenager yeah, that's it. That's with a, a single adult? Uh, it was, it was funny. But that particular night, word got out that black kids were coming. I had a dozen parents show up. Mm-hmm. And when that bus pulled up, they, um, the parents ran in to the building and stood and heard it. All the white kids over to the right side, it was set up kind of like a church with an aisle down the middle, heard it, all the kids to the right side. And as the black kids come in, they politely said, oh, you guys can sit over here. They literally segregated the room. Wow. Without consulting me, without anything. Wow. Um, I, I can see right there. Oh, fuck. Uh, first of all, why haven't you guys been here in the previous weeks? Yeah. Now you're taking over this meeting in a way that's absolutely wrong and inappropriate. I just did the best I could. And uh, I was up for a pay raise. They were supposed to give me, a, if I succeeded by in, in getting at least 10 kids coming every Sunday night, they would give me $15 a week. So the next week was my board meeting. I had to go in front of them, tell them what I'd done, show them that I'd succeed. I'd more than succeeded. I was getting 30 kids a week. Kids from other churches were coming to our Yes. Year. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but when they had some, they, they had questions about it and all. And uh, they said, well, our budget's really tight this year. We're not sure we can do that. And uh, so, wow. you know, a few days later, I get word that they're not, they're going to keep me at $5 a week. They're not going to raise my salary to 15. So, and, and you know, the word was, Daryl, you really ought to quit while you're at <laughs> So mm. I went back to wow. my home church where my parents uh, were and uh, mm-hmm. that you ask why I left religion, yeah. that kind of an experience hit me hard. I, mm-hmm. It really hit me because my grandmother had always taught me that song. Jesus loves the little children, red yeah. and yellow, black and white. They're right. all precious, which was bullshit, you know, mm-hmm. not with these people. Mm-hmm. And um, so then I went back to my home church and troublemaker that I am, I, uh, <laughs> I went before the board and said, hey, I want I want to open our our gymnasium here. We had this incredibly beautiful church facility with a huge gym, beautiful gymnasium that never got used ever. Mm-hmm. Not mm-hmm. unless somebody had a retirement or right. you know, somebody had a birthday or, or funeral. You know, that's the only time it ever got used. And it had you know everything you need to play good basketball, including the basketballs. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. So I talked him into letting me open open up the, the gymnasium um, three times a week for several hours and they would pay me. They were going to pay me $5 an hour to do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was still wasn't very much back then, by the way. I mean, for what I was doing and um, I'd get kids coming in from all over that neighborhood. But unfor- unfortunately, from their point of view, there were far too many Hispanic and black kids coming to that, <laughs> to that. Wow. Wow. <laughs> and of course they had to use the restroom. So black kids using this white church's restroom, it it was it was crazy. But at the same time, I started a bus ministry. I, I'm, I'm telling you all this to show you how how invested I was in this. Yes, I started a bus ministry. I read a book on how to start one, and um, uh, I I start going out to the projects and picking up kids. Of course, mostly Hispanic and mostly black kids, and bring them to church. Yeah. Well, isn't that what Jesus wants us to do? Go pick up people and bring him to him? Mm-hmm. <laughs> not in this church. That's not what Jesus wanted. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so uh, little black kids running around, quote, uncontrolled. They weren't. They were, I mean, they were just kids. You know, the yeah. white kids were uncontrolled, too, when the parents. Exactly. Were yeah. 
But uh, little old ladies in white hair did not like this at all. Oh. And they did everything they could to get me to stop it. I didn't. My, my At this point in time, my dad is the chairman of the board. Of the, board so mm. what are they gonna do you know and how and old were you else? about that how old were huh? you how old were well, you well i would have been 21 at the time okay. and i got married when i was 20 so i was right. newly married but and she and i were both in college uh, mm -hmm. at the time so um that was uh, i i uh, i got i got finished with college and i went into the i want to go in the ministry but i won't go into urban ministry i didn't want to go to typical ministry so i um got a scholarship and got some um opportunity to get go to scarrett college for christian workers in nashville tennessee it doesn't exist anymore but you can google it and there's still information about it it was a it was a missionary training school um, from back in the 1920s mm -hmm. by the time i was going to it it was pretty liberal methodist kind of uh, school and i uh uh I left Wichita to go to Nashville, Tennessee to attend Scarrett College. And my coworker who was helping me run the bus, turns out he was a spy and he had been turned on by the board oh. to help me until I went off to graduate school and then to shut the program down. Oh. Literally the week I left, that bus never started up again. So we've got a gymnasium that never gets used and we've got a bus that never gets used. Mm. Uh, just sitting there. and. You know, it seemed to me like a reasonable thing for a Christian to be doing. I mean, is it, is it against Jesus's law to bring children into right. churches? Wow. Anyway, those things started hitting me hard. And then I went to Nashville and I saw the incredible uh, racism in the Southern culture, especially mm -hmm. Christian Southern culture. Mm -hmm. I, I did two years, got my master's degree. I'm glad I did because my mentor within Scarrett College, um, this guy named Bill Burns, Barnes, Bill Barnes. And he was like one of the early civil rights. This guy was doing civil rights when nobody else knew what the term meant. Right. Okay. And he was one of my professors and one mm -hmm. of my mentors. So I really, he just died about five years ago. I think he was, was in his nineties. He had mm -hmm. at, it's almost to the day he died. He was still harassing the city commission over different housing issues and all mm -hmm. <laughs> So I got top-notch training uh, in Saul Alinsky kinds of act activism. I don't know. Do you know Saul Alinsky? The... Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, Janice, we need to get you educated here. <laughs> uh, you need to go get a It's a little tiny book. You're, all your listeners need to read it, too. It's the only book Saul Alinsky ever read, wrote, but it's called Rules for Radicals. Oh. It wonderful. is the Bible for anybody who's activist. Thank you. Here's the problem. Conservatives have read the book, too. Mm. Uh, and they actually use some of Saul Alinsky's approach to further there because, you know, it's like a hammer. You can use a hammer to hit a nail or kill somebody. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. it was originally written for, for radicals, for liberals. But anyway, I would encourage you to go read it. It's very Thank short. You. Book. Anyway, so by the time I was finished with two years of graduate school, I am super liberal super liberal christian um i won't call myself an agnostic at that time but i, I was close to it mm -hmm. <laughs> and then it, it from then on, i was just slowly inching inching away until i got divorced mm -hmm. getting you know you're talking about divorcing religion well mm -hmm. i will say that getting divorced after almost 18 years of marriage mm -hmm. uh to a, a great woman we just mm -hmm. should never have been married in the first place she and i both agree on that and uh, we had two great kids but um getting divorced allowed me to do what i needed to do with my life around religion yes. until that time her family was super religious my family was super religious mm -hmm. my grandparents you know it's like you're stuck you can't get out of this bubble yeah. Mm -hmm. You got to go to Christmas together. You got to do all this shit. Mm -hmm. Well, at least half of that family is now. I don't have to go to Christmas to anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And on my side of the family, by this time, I start dating and I, I start dating this woman. Eventually became my second wife. And I told my mom, I'm dating this this woman. And my mom says, well, I hope she's a good Christian woman. Oh, and boy. Said, mom, if she's a good Christian woman, I'm running as fast as I can. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when I came out to my mom as an atheist. <laughs> yeah. And the first time in my life, it was it would have been about 1990, 91. First time in my life I'd used the term atheist. Mm hmm. 
to describe myself. Mm -hmm. uh, but I still had a long ways to go because I am a psychologist and I had a practice in organizational psych. And I just I couldn't be too open about it because I had a lot of evangelical clients. Right. And I didn't know what to do with that. So yeah. I continued until I, not, about 2001. Um, I, I'd been I got divorced again and started dating and <laughs> dating this woman became my lifelong travel companion. Nice. Um, she's my travel wife. I'm her travel husband. I like it. <laughs> we call each other when we're traveling. <laughs> Everybody assumes we're married. No, no, we're not. We're just good friends that travel. I like and, it. Uh, Judy, we're on the plane to go to Ireland. We're we're going to go to visit Ireland for three weeks. And she is reading a manuscript of an article I had written, but I hadn't published. In fact, never did publish it. I'll tell you why later. And she looks at me and says, Daryl, you know, you need to shit or get off the pot. You know, you're an atheist. Wow. <laughs> Way to go. And Judy had been an atheist since she was 14 and went to church camp and prayed to Jesus and nobody answered. She said, well, that must not be any God up there. So I'm going to be an atheist. <laughs> uh, she's she's funny. So she'd been on my case and I finally admitted to her. Yeah, you're right. So I, I openly came out about 2001. Mm. Um, as an atheist, but I didn't really do anything except I was writing this article, which I never published. And I waited about another five or six years after that. And I got inspired by uh, Dawkins, Hitchens, Harris, Bennett. I read all those books, including, um, um, well, se several other authors. And I realized that nobody's a psychologist. They're all you know, there are other things, but they're not psychologists. Right. They're nobody bringing a clinical view. There's nobody bringing a, a brain science view to this issue. And that inspired me to write The God Virus. Well, by the time that book comes out, I'm, I'm out whether I like it or not. And here I am talking to you. Wow. That years is later. Exciting. That's, that is quite a journey. So what would you say was the hardest part, <clears throat> pardon me, the hardest part for you about divorcing religion, about actually finally making that break? Was it, was it telling your parents? Was it telling clients or just, you know, shifting your focus professionally? What did you find was the hardest part? It was, I didn't suffer emotionally. I, I never believed in hell, never believed in that bullshit. Mm -hmm. I never uh, had a, a terror. I, I, I had always had, I'm the oldest, and me and my next brother down are the two caregivers for my parents and were until they died. So we had a very loving and caring um, relationship with our with Nice. Mom. So I didn't have, even though they were, my parents, when they retired, and they retired early at about late 50s, they they became missionaries to Mexico. They even created their own 501c3 called Missions in Mexico. Mm. And they would go down to Mexico and do their mission work. Mm. And, and here's the thing. I even gave them money for their missionary work. Oh. As an atheist, I gave them money. And here's why. They didn't go down and preach to anybody. They didn't get anybody a chick, chick track. They didn't get anybody Bibles. They collected thousands, I would say tens of thousands of gallon bags. They would, they would go to churches around, around the whole state of Kansas. They would get in their car or truck and go to all these churches and oh, hand out these Ziploc gallon bags with a list of items like shampoo, toothpaste, toothbrushes, and say, we'll be back in two weeks if you want to help us in our mission to Mexico. And then go back to that church in two weeks and they would gather a hundred of these bags full of all these items. They would put them in their big RV, take it down to the Mexican border. They didn't go across the border with the RV. And they would meet the, the Mexican orphanage, uh, people who ran the Mexican orphanage, the Christian church orphanage. Mm -hmm. And they would meet them in pickup trucks and pick all this stuff up and take it down to the Christian college, wow. to the Christian orphanage, and to a village, a high, high poverty village that they, they supported too. And my parents never asked never said a word about Jesus, hardly. They never asked if, if you want to get baptized. They never did any of that shit. They just said, we're here to help. Well, yeah, we're Christians, and we believe this is our, our duty as a Christian, but we're not We're not going to convert you if you don't want to be converted. And they would give, give these things to Catholics. They didn't care. They'd go to the Catholic Church and hand them out to people who needed them. The priest hated that. <laughs> <laughs> What, what happened to my parents, though, and this was instructive because it also was a part of me, 
they went down there doing their mission work. And the longer they did that, the more pissed off they got at the other missionaries. Because all those missionaries did when they went down there was harass people, mm -hmm. become Christian. They never gave them anything. They never helped them. My parents literally got hammer and nails out and helped build orphanages, helped wow. build dormitories, helped build uh, churches. My dad even would go around to all the churches um, in Kansas with a big, he had a big trailer and he would ask the church, do you have any old pianos you want to get rid of? Every church has an old piano. They don't <laughs> need it. So he would put them on there and drive them down to Mexico and give these old pianos to the, the churches. I mean, that was, that was pretty, in other words, my parents were, were creative and they wanted to help people just like I wanted to help people. Yes. And, and it had, it had less and less to do with Jesus. The interesting thing about them was at their funerals, there was almost no religion. They, they themselves became less and less religious. Wow. As they, as that, that missionary experience, I think took the religious fervor out of them. Wow. Didn't take the one to help fervor out of them, took mm -hmm. the religious fervor out. Of them. So they were humanists. They, I think they were Christian humanists by the yeah. time they died. Um, yeah. It, it was fun to watch my parents make that transition. Exactly. Well, then how did you end up um, starting recovering from religion? You had already written your books by then? Yeah, I, I wrote I uh, wrote The God Virus in uh, it, it was published in January of 2009. Mm. And I instantly started getting it, the book sold far better than I thought it would. I, I mean, wow. I, yeah, it was it was ridiculous how, how well the book sold. Uh, the downside of that was I, I had an organization. I'm an organizational psychologist, so I'm consulting with Fortune 500 companies. I'm going off to Blue Cross Blue Shield or Cummins or or General Electric. I mean, these are huge companies that I'm yeah. going flying on an airplane, even to as far as Wales and uh Canada. Wow. I even went to Vancouver several times. Working. Wow. <laughs> Calgary. I went to Toronto. I was, uh, I was all over the North America. You've been everywhere. Yeah. Um, was, uh, was, a, it was a fun, I did it for 35 years. It was a wow. great profession. Okay. But when I, the book came out, uh, I told my staff before I ever published the book, what I was doing, I had five staff that worked for me and great people. Uh, every one of them, worked for me for years and, and I still keep track of them. I mean, one just called me for a, for a job recommendation last oh, week. So yeah, nice. we're still keeping track of great, great staff. Mm -hmm. And some of them were religious and some weren't. Mm -hmm. In fact, I was introduced to flying spaghetti monster by my <laughs> IT guy. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> He's an atheist. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, I, I just decided um, to, uh, to publish the book. I told him and they, they got upset. My my office manager said, Daryl, we're going to lose clients over this. Mm -hmm. I said, well, uh, Julie was her name. I, I can't help that. I've got to do this. This is important. Mm -hmm. If we lose a few clients, I, I, I don't doubt that. Well, six months later, I lost all but two clients. I mean, it decimated my business. And uh, but the two clients stuck with me and we still worked together for a few years after that. But, you, you know, we, you don't some of these clients I've been with for 20 years oh. as a consultant, you usually go in, do your thing and leave and you're never seen again. Mm -hmm. But so if they're hiring me to come back for 20 years, they must like what I'm doing. But I also knew that the, some of these key people like in the human resource department were pretty evangelical. So the, they stopped returning my phone calls. They stopped writing contracts with me, everything. So that was the downside. The upside. Shocking. Was, yeah. It, well, it was shocking because I was unexpected. Yeah. Unexpected. But the, that was the downside. The upside was the God virus sold well enough that it almost made up for all the lost income. Awesome. If you're an author or you're thinking about being an author, don't count on that. Nobody makes money off of books. Mm -hmm. Nobody. Mm -hmm. I mean, Dawkins made money, of course, Hitchens and Harris probably did. I didn't make a fortune, but at least it kept me afloat. And uh, it forced me to retire several years earlier than I expected. Mm -hmm. But then because I'm being forced out of that profession, <laughs> I'm in this one now. <laughs> yes. But within months after publishing that book, people are calling me, emailing me, 
uh, texting me, I'm Facebooking and everything, you name it, even, even in my space. <laughs> 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 and uh, I need help. And I, I can't help. I can't help hundreds of people. They read my book. They said, I need somebody to talk to. I love your book. I love what you say in your book because while all those other books were highly praised and awarded and all that sort of stuff, none of them went to the heart of the matter. And that's your emotions and how it got there. Mm-hmm. Why are you afraid of hell? Why are you afraid of, you know, of, of uh, losing your family or Jesus or whatever? And uh, the God virus addressed those issues. So I just announced one day on meetup that I was going to hold a, a meeting um, um, a meeting over at the uh, International House of, House of Pancakes, the back room. And uh, I have to say International House of Pancakes because IHOP means International House of Prayer. I know. And its headquarters <laughs> is here in Kansas City. <laughs> so I have to be careful about distinguishing that. The other IHOP, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So I, I go, I announce a couple of weeks early and then I meet up, I show up the room and 11 people show up for this meeting. And mm-hmm. I only know one of the people in the room. The other 10 people are total strangers. Wow. Which tells, that alone tells you something. Why would you get in your car and go to a, meet somebody you've never seen before? You right. have no who they are. Mm-hmm. And I asked two questions. I said, how did religion hurt you? How did you benefit from leaving? And I, three hours later, I've got people crying. I've got people pouring their souls out in front yeah. of each other. I've got people, it was horrible. I mean, it was mm. horrible in a positive way. I guess you mm. say they got it off their chest. Yes. And three hours later, the, the restaurant manager is kicking us out because he's closed in the room. Yeah. And at that moment in time, I realized I had a tiger by the tail. This is, this is important. People need this support. Mm-hmm. Now, I'll be honest with you. The idea came from my publicist who said, Daryl, why don't you start a group called Recover from Religion so you can publicize your book and sell more books? Yeah. That was his idea. And I <laughs> it just was took, a great one. Yeah. I just took the idea and ran with it. Yeah. Thinking, oh, it was a great gimmick, so to speak. But after the end of that meeting, I realized this ain't no gimmick. This is dead serious. Mm-hmm. And so the, it was a it was a uh, melding of the book and the psychological need that people had. Mm. And I realized I, I needed to start something. And that's, that's the official start. April uh, was April of uh, 2009 that I started it. So we are 13 years old this past April as an organization and growing enormously. We, I can't keep up. Gail and I cannot keep up with what's going on sometimes. It's incredible. The need is so great. And in particular, since your former president, I think he really had a huge role in emptying the pews. And we have so many folks now who are just running out of the churches and saying, now what? That was my entire identity. My whole life was that. And and a lot of my family is still thoroughly entrenched in that religion. What do I do now? And people right. are just hungry uh, for support. And so recovering from religion is a great place for them to get started. It is. And we're helping people with the uh, steps of divorcing religion. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. And you've been a guest at uh, both of the conferences on religious trauma that we've had already. And you'll be speaking again at Shameless Sexuality Life After Purity Culture. The yep. conference is coming up in October. I'm very pleased and looking forward to that. I hope we have a great attendance for that online conference as well. I think I think you will. You've promoted these and developed it so well. I'm shocked. I mean, I was I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, Janice. I was I was fucking skeptical. <laughs> I was skeptical. I've seen a lot of people start things and never finish them. But I did not know you <laughs> or how tenacious you are. And, oh, boy. And I have some great helpers as well that helped me put the events uh, together over at Sherpa Group, my friend Heather. And of course, uh, Dr. Winnell Marlene has been such a huge help. At what point did you connect with Dr. Winnell? Uh, we well, I had read her book, uh, Journey Free. Um, Leaving the Fold. I'm sorry, Learning. <laughs> Leaving <laughs> the Fold, Thank yeah. Thank you for correcting me. That's right. Uh-huh. Uh, I had um, 
I had read the book and uh, knowing that what she was doing was similar to what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. We did a little bit of connecting by email. Um, I don't remember. It's been four, 13, 14 years, you know, Yeah. but not long after my book came out, I was at a conference, uh, I believe it was the Texas free thought conference would have been about 2010 or so. Mm -hmm. And she was there too. She was giving a speech. I was giving a speech and we connected face to face for the first time there and really hit it off. I really appreciated what she was trying to do. And, you know, she's taken it to another level. It, what I wanted to do was provide peer support and, and resources. And at that time, I still hadn't started the um, secular therapy project, but I was thinking about it. And mm -hmm. uh, so I consulted with, with uh, Marlene about the secular therapy project. And she seemed excited about it. And mm -hmm. she actually jumped on board. She was one of the first secular therapists that we registered. Nice. I can literally say she was probably one of the first five that we got into our database. Right, right. So she was a big supporter right off the bat. And I'm always a big supporter. If I, if, just before you and I started, I was talking to her on the phone because she's getting ready to promote her next uh, Journey Free. The uh, retreat. Free. And we always, mm -hmm. we always put that out and let people know. Um, Excellent. About it. Yes. And, and now, of course, we do our own uh, retreat, but it's, again, we're not here to do, provide deep psychotherapeutic support for people. Mm -hmm. our, the therapist can, but that's why we send people to Marlene. Our services are, you know, most people don't know, don't need therapy to get out of religion. Mm -hmm. I didn't need therapy. I got out fine all by myself. Mm -hmm. I still needed some help. I could have used some more help. Yeah. That's not, there's a lot of people that could just use a little more help. Another step, you know, it's a big step to leave the church. You yes. know, it might fall on your face, but if you have a few in between steps, you mm -hmm. can make it all by yourself. Yeah. However, there are some people that need big, they need somebody help them build the steps. Yes. I guess you could say that's right. And that's what Marlene is doing. And I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm an admirer of everything she does and why she's doing it. And yes. she's, she's like you, she has been, tenacious in mm -hmm. uh, providing the services and uh, getting the word out. So when you, you mentioned the secular therapy project uh, and that, um, as I understand it, uh, basically provides um, a list of secular therapists. So people who are looking for a secular therapist in their state, they can talk to them and not be afraid that the therapist is going to tell them they need to pray or they need magic crystals or anything like that. It's just going to be tried and true uh, methods of uh, helping people, working with people uh, as they are coping with this massive transition in yep. their life out of religion. And then how do, how do you uh, and the clergy project fit in together? Well, we're, we're independent entities. Clergy project started about two years after recover from religion did. It was started by um, Daniel Dennett, Linda Lascola and Dan Barker. And I can't remember who else. Oh, oh Richard Dawkins. Oh. Those, those four people were doing, well, Dan Dennett, Linda Scola was doing some research uh, Lynn is a professor. Dan Dennett was a professor, of course. Uh, they were doing some research on they had this suspicion, sneaking suspicion that there were ministers in the pulpit that didn't believe what they were saying. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they did some research and they ended up finding a whole bunch of ministers that didn't know, you know, didn't believe what they were saying. And as a result, they started the clergy project about two years after we did. But we were all in support in favor of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, then as time gone, has gone on, we we send people, we get ministers calling us up. Um, and so we will send them to the clergy project. Yes. But the other side of the coin is a clergy project. Those are people who are, may still be in the pulpit or if they're not, they're out um, in some way, shape or form. But they have kids. They have wives, husbands, mm -hmm. daughters, sons. And those people have been affected by by the religious uh, upbringing they had. Mm -hmm. And there's nobody to serve the children of PK, you know, the PKs. Yeah. Here's kids. Well, they send people to us. And so we are serving the, uh, the victims, if you will, of the, um, what, what do you call it when something, in a war, when something, you get killed by the bomb, but it wasn't intended for you. you know, right, the friendly fire almost. Now, yeah. Anyway, uh, 
the minister thought he was doing good, but even yes. as bad, they're 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 screwing up their kids. Mm -hmm. Well, the clergy project doesn't work with spouses. It doesn't work with kids. We do. Oh, oh. So that's where that's where we'll we'll work with people, and we even have a channel inside of our organization called Clergy Plus, and it's a channel that people can come to and they can talk to each other. You can be a clergy member. You can be a wife of a clergyman. You can be a kid of a clergy. We don't care. And you get in and you can talk to each other about the problems of dealing with parents that were ministers. Right, you know, right. Or a husband or a spouse that was a minister. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. Yes. And yeah. I'm, I'm working with uh, some people right now who are very interested in setting up actual physical locations uh, in America and potentially in Canada. Recovery houses for people, particularly clergy, but we'll do others as well who have left and are trying to rebuild their their lives. So they just need they're sometimes kind of shell shocked that they've lost their faith or they've lost their job and they need some support in that way, whether whether people are going to be coming for a month or a few months or a couple of weeks um we're kind of throwing around ideas about how what that might look like and what would be involved uh, for that because there is a need because it's is. a big deal yeah there is well i'm glad to hear somebody's working on that that's that's not where we're at we aren't going to do that but mm -hmm. uh, we would be a referral to you you know yes we have people saying because we do get that we yeah. get saying I need to get out of the house. I'm getting divorced. And oh, yeah, there's yeah. a lot. And I hear a lot uh, also from uh, people leaving the Muslim faith. And then there's oh. Oh. additional safety concerns there. Okay. And yeah. then there are other groups to try and plug those people into a secular underground network and free hearts, free minds with um, Yasmin Mohammed. Yeah, right. um, and I, you know, I'm in Canada, so I feel like my, my reach and my ability to help uh, people internationally is a little bit mm, limited. Um, but the conference on religious trauma, people are attending that from all around the world yeah. and getting to know it. Um, so I wonder, I wonder, is there anything uh, that's giving you hope right now? If there's a lot of turmoil, we know that there's a lot of upheaval, particularly in the United States, but around the world as well. Is there anything? I mean, you're an atheist. People wonder, well, what's what's your hope? What happens then? Can you speak to that issue? Well, I, I got hope on a lot of different levels. I don't know which way. Uh, I don't even know where to start. <laughs> <laughs> Just two weeks ago, my state in Kansas overturned or prevented a, a terrible amendment to our constitution. And yes. I worked on that. My partner, Barb, worked on it. Wow. That Yellow. was surprising. I was so excited. We were cheering. Yeah. Yeah. We were all shocked that it was a victory of 17 or almost 18 points. I mean, that's yeah. huge. Nothing. Nobody wins by 18 points usually. Mm -hmm. Mm. actually uh, that kind of a thing but so there's some hope there uh, i think kansas politically is i mean it's a super conservative state and yet they they voted the opposite of this so i don't know hopefully we're leading something there my hope but that's political my my i think of course i can go into my theories about what's going on <laughs> around the globe and i'm i don't think that's what are here to talk about so i want to stay focused just on on religion i think since I started recovering from religion in 2009, the snowball has just gotten faster and faster and faster. And we can see it through the Pew, uh, Pew surveys that show, mm -hmm. you know, the youngest um, cohort of, say, 20 to 35 year olds are the least religious. And mm -hmm. as long as the younger you get, the less religious mm -hmm. people seem to be. And the fact that we are not just getting phone, you know, we take phone calls and we take chats. And we try to help people. We try to refer them on to our own resources or other people like yourself's resources. But we get we're getting more and more calls and chats from Muslim majority countries, for example. Mm, wow. From uh, Catholic majority countries, countries that are known for their religiosity. We're seeing more and more chats and, and phone calls from those places. Mm -hmm. We're also seeing more use of our resources. I mean, whether somebody talks to us or not, we still have this vast library of resources that's really well 
curated and uh, well organized so you can find what you want pretty easily and if somebody never talks to one of our agents they could still find the answer to their question or some yes. resources for what they're yes they're doing yeah. so that it gives me a lot of hope that we're well the fact that we have 300 volunteers in 16 time zones that's incredible we have we have just hit 657 therapists in eight countries wow and 45 u.s states we have 30 we just passed 30,000 registered clients for the psychotherapy project i mean these are all indicators of I mean, we started in 2012 with 25 i had to beat the bushes to get 25 <laughs> therapists um, I finally got 25, but I didn't want to start without having therapists. I mean, it's stupid to start a therapy th project if you don't have any therapists. <laughs> <laughs> so it took me a year to beat the bushes. And then in May of 2012, we officially announced it and had all the software developed and everything. We just were able to launch it. But we've gone from 25 to 657 in in 12 years. That's, I'm sorry, 10 years. Amazing. And 30,000. But more importantly to me, and this gives me super hope, I talk to people all the time that, that say, I, I, got a, I got a therapist through the Secular Therapy Project. Oh, wonderful. Or I've had three therapists in my life, and they all sent me back to church until I finally got a therapist through the Secular Therapy Project. Mm -hmm. And that is, that is so hopeful that people, I talked to, a, I did a um, interview yesterday, just yesterday with a uh, uh, an atheist activist. It wasn't recorded. We were just, she wanted to pick my brain on some stuff. Mm -hmm. And what blew my mind was how many times we would be talking about, I'd recommend somebody. And she said, oh yeah, I talked to them and they mentioned this secular therapy project. And then we decided to mention somebody. Oh yeah, they all, I talked to them too. And they mentioned the <laughs> secular therapy project. Yes. <laughs> I'm thinking, okay, well, that's good. By the end of it, she would probably named six, six other secular leaders that it all told her about the secular therapy project. Fantastic. Which means the awareness is out there and people yes. are getting help rather than getting sent back to church or oh, getting crystals. Yeah. And and you really um, you really touched on that uh, at the inaugural conference on religious trauma when you actually were very much poking the bear and talking about why religious trauma isn't isn't why religion isn't talked about as being traumatizing in the psychology world yeah. um, and and I run into that all the time in my governing body that I'm a part of I think there are tons of Christians who get credentialed to be counselors. Like I think sometimes that they, it feels like they outweigh the number of secular counselors or the secular ones are just scared to say, to identify themselves as atheist or um, secular. And I certainly run into uh, so-called progressive Christian therapists who, uh, you know, really try and take me to task on that, that I shouldn't, uh, that I shouldn't be telling people I'm, I'm atheist and we should all be able to work with people no matter what. But if you're a true devout Christian, your mandate is always to be drawing people into the fold or drawing them back to the fold. You want to be encouraging them to stay in their marriage, no matter how abusive it may be, and that God is the answer and the Bible is the answer. And that's just so damaging and deadly in some circumstances. Yep. Yep. Well, and that's why we... Um our whole system um, allows for total anonymity between on the therapist side and on the client side. So they don't have to reveal themselves because uh, therapists are in danger of, of losing yes. their whole practice. If they're in mm -hmm. you know, Dallas, Texas, and they say I'm an atheist or I'm secular, that's a, right. like a, that's a curse word among evangelicals. Right. But, yeah. but I am, um, as I've told this story many times, I had a PhD level psychologist applied to secret therapy project about five years ago now he was from notre dame phd from notre dame that's pretty damn good i'm thinking mm -hmm. but catholic still he and he admitted he was catholic so i said well i need to ask you a few questions and can you keep your religion out of your therapy and he said sure i can i'm a professional i got a phd so okay let me ask you one question a uh, 20 year old woman comes to you sees you for two sessions on the third session she comes in and says she tells you she's pregnant and she wants some help relaxing as she walks through the 
the harassment she's going to get when she gets an abortion on mm-hmm. tomorrow. Mm-hmm. I didn't get a response from him. So I emailed him again. No response. Finally, I emailed him a third time. Wow. He got right back to me and said, I couldn't help her. Wow. Yeah. It, I do not trust anybody. I'm, I'm sorry. You can argue with me all day. I do not trust you if you still believe in in uh, magic, uh, magic yes. prayer and magic mm-hmm. people and mm-hmm. people walking on water and raising from mm-hmm. the dead. I don't trust you because you're too easily fooled mm-hmm. and, and you're not reality based. You're going to be a terrible cognitive behavioral therapist Mm -hmm. because CBT is very evidence-based. Yes. I mean, you're teaching people how to evaluate their true environment, not their supernatural environment. (laughs) Oh, that, that is so true. And that's really reality based thinking is uh, imperative. And that's, that's the way I work with my clients as well. Let's really face reality, radically accept what that reality is. Then we can make some informed decisions moving forward. Oh, this you has know, been such a joy to talk. One of the big about. influences, I'll say this one last thing. And yeah, we've got, sure. One of the big influences on my life that mm-hmm. ultimately helped me get out was when I was in my 20s studying to be a therapist. I was still a Christian member at that time, a liberal one, but still Christian. <laughs> yeah. But my mentor, I, I had the good fortune of, of being sent to a workshop with Albert Ellis and then later went on to get a lot more training from Albert Ellis. So wow. he was my man. Albert Ellis was my mentor and he was an out out atheist. Of wow. Yeah. A lot of people don't know, but he was like atheist of the year for um, American atheists. I did um, not know like 1979. I think they, they named him atheist of the year. Mm-hmm. But anyway, you don't get much more atheist than Albert Ellis. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having me on. I'm, I hope your podcast just takes off. I'm always, I'm always happy to talk about anything related to what I do. So Um, Thank you. I'm sure I'm sure we'll have you uh, on again. I'd like to uh, have you on some time to talk more about sex and sexuality and how religion handles that. And I'm so pleased you'll be joining us at the Shameless Sexuality Conference. Thanks for giving us this time on your birthday. Have a great day. (laughs) Okay. thanks, Daryl. Take care. 